online hate, which I've recently really suffered from because Anne Heche was one of my best friends. And the day that she got in the crash, I was the first person at the hospital with her podcast business partner. And, you know, and these girls are my girls, you know, right. every time anything wonderful happened, boom, there are the calls. And to lose her in such a tragic way. And then the vitriol that came, which was honestly so unexpected. And at first you're angry, but then I felt bad for them. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I just have to love them because they're not getting love, which is why they're angry, which is why they're full of vitriol, which is why they're attacking. Well, if my conversation prior to hitting record is any indication of today's podcast interview, you are going to be blown away. I feel as if I know today's guest my entire life, even though I've never met him before, except we've lived in all the same places, just at different stages of our life. And before I go any further, let me just tell you a little bit about him. Although his bio will not do him justice, you have to wait and listen to him. He is a renowned media entrepreneur in the truest sense of the word. He's a celebrity stylist, so I had to take my brush out and do my hair. He is a TV personality. He's a philanthropist. And this is a man who has gone literally from rags to riches. So let me stop talking and introduce you to today's guest. Put on your seatbelt because Derek Warburton is about to take us for a ride. Welcome, Derek. Hi, how are you? I, I have to tell you, I'm like, oh, see, every time somebody intros me, it's so funny because it's such a dream that I get to live this life now, you know? And yesterday I did, uh, I hosted the Love Boat and it was so much fun. It was so much fun. It's for an organization called Worthy of Love. And I've been working with them for a long time and they do birthday parties for homeless children that have never gotten a present, never had a party in their life, nothing. And they live in shelters. And, but they do the all over Los Angeles and Houston and now coming to Atlanta. And the organizer and the uh, director of the organization is called Sister Mary because Mother Teresa was taken. That's my big joke about her because she's a, a she's a gift. Is she a, a real? Is she and, a real nun? No, she's actually a Jew, which I love. <laughs> That's what I love I about love her it. even more. She's a blonde Jew. That's why I love it. <laughs> I, I love that. And but with the heart of gold and she's introducing me and saying all these beautiful things. And when I get up there, I was like teary because to hear that now after years of fighting to be me is such a blessing that it's unbelievable to hear what people think of me now, you know, come out of everyone's mouth on a regular basis. And it's but, just- but Derek, but Derek, hang on a sec, time out. It's not what we think about you, it's who you are. This is- and I know that, and I, and I know that, but it's still, you know, it's like when you- You know it intellectually. Yes, of course. And then, but to, but to really now, so often hear it from others and it's it's such it's so beautiful because that was not my life you know and and now as an adult and a flourishing adult it's just it's really a blessing and I I never forget you know and so I gave my speech yesterday and it was so wonderful because pe I mean people were literally crying and then this man who I'd never met a t some TikTok star, which I know nothing about, but I, <laughs> I looked later and he got on stage, just kind of stormed on stage and was like, I, I was, I grew up homeless and no one cares and no one's here doing this kind of work. And, and he turned to me and he was like, I can't believe you, you come and you do these things. 
You fill these rooms. You uh, you get people to give money. You give money, and you bring all these people together to share in this joy of giving because it is a gift. And I will just never forget. I I don't forget. I'm constantly in this space of gratefulness of what I've been able to achieve, but also become in my heart and my soul. And even though I was always that, it's still such a blessing to be recognized finally Mm -hmm. for something I always knew that, but they could never see, you know, I had just done this. um, I had just uh, done another podcast and this cis white uh, heterosexual man had said to me, you know, you are probably a black sheep like me. And I said, oh no, sir, I was no black sheep. I and we are unicorns. And just because they don't know how special we are doesn't mean it's not true. I love that. I love, right? Who's to say what's normal? All right, so so, why do you think... I didn't even know we were going to go here, but let's run with it. You're like, no, I don't know what to do. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know what? There's like 10 different lanes we could go down from what you just shared, right? So why do you think when people make it, they forget where they're from? Like, you know, I we were talking before, right? But even if I didn't share this with you, I open up my mouth and you know that I went to Brooklyn, right? I'm from Brooklyn. You know, this is not a choke private boarding school accent. And for years I was embarrassed by that. And my husband was great. He's like, no, 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 you know, you shouldn't be. Now I just embrace it. Like when I speak, I did give keynotes. I use it as part of my talk, right? It's part of my authenticity and I embrace it. But but for years I did have a hard time with that, right? But But for you, you've embraced where you came from to help you get to where you are. But why do you think so many people forget that? What happens to them? I think that for so many, they have had to fight and stab and go against their morals and feel like they have to do anything to get ahead that they want to put all of that behind them. And I think for a lot of people, their their drive is their fear of being there again. So they don't want to admit where they came from because now they feel like they've built this facade to, to kind of fit in. And I know for myself, I never fit in, but I never really cared. Mm -hmm. Because I thought it was more special to be different, you know, and I'm in an industry where being special is the gift, you know, although funny enough, even within my industry, which I've shifted from anyways, and but I have been able to layer everything I do now where I'm just an anomaly in every industry, they don't know what to do with me, but I have something to offer everywhere. And that's Mm -hmm. been, you know, for me, my success, but for so many, they want to forget because they're like uh, that. I'm never going back there. I'm never going back there. I'm never going back there. And my true success was facing it, was accepting it. And frankly, service was my way in the door. And so I had to make myself even more relatable to everyone because I wasn't relatable because I was, I was very special, different to them, whatever. And so when I walked in the door, I always put myself at a level where somebody could relate to me, even looking at me. You so know, how, did because- you do that? how did you do that? So what you're saying is, is so interesting. All I kept hearing of is people forget, not so much they forget, they're afraid because they don't want to be outed. <laughs> So, so how did you do that? How did you make so, yourself? So it's fun, okay. You well, because fun? I knew, so I was, at, so I was homeless from 13 
to about 15 years old. So let around, me interrupt you for a second. What, 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 what preceded the homelessness, may I ask? Uh, I guess a normal family life. My parents were married. Uh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, upheaval within that just because of uh, my brother had died of SIDS and, you know, th things, things happen in families and that are very, that are tragic and things, you know, and then dysfunctional relationships and whatnot. And so when my parents got a divorce, my mother uh, had met someone new and it happened to be a woman. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I mean, we're probably near the same age and I, um, you know, that was not a time where it was that acceptable. It was the very early 80s and people were not accepting at all. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, had some issues, obviously, and um, she never really came out, you know, and so the, until we all she brought away. home until she started to date the woman. Oh, no, she never came out. Ever, ever, ever oh, until tortured. much, much, much later when, so she was with that woman from when I was 10 until uh, probably over 10 years, but I had left because I, it was so abusive within that time and we were mm -hmm. homeless in that time and so many things had happened in that time and even when we weren't homeless anymore, I thought, oh, well, we'll get better. And it got worse, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when I finally left because I was suicidal and I just knew I wasn't going to, it wasn't going to work. It was just like, I chose myself okay. that day. It was too, you know, when it I was left. too toxic. It was too toxic for you. So Wait. homeless was, was a better alternative, which is amazing when you think about it, right? Well, my father and my stepmom are my parents. That's who I call my parents. My stepmom is my mom. And okay. I love, her. like, I love her. Like, yeah, she's, I, I, I've always been lucky that I've had amazing people in my life. I've mm -hmm. been so blessed with that to this day. And I have a million friends. That's why I can't have a best friend because I have so many and our relationships are so special for different reasons that I can't label anything like that. You know, it's just, they're my chosen family and that's how I talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, mm -hmm. But when I left, uh, I was 15, almost 16 years old. And um, I haven't seen her since that day. Hmm. Still, I've still not seen her since that day. And that when I left, I had decided that I had chose me because she had chosen someone else and she chose that person over me. And I was like, well, <laughs> someone has to choose me and it's gonna be me. And right. when I left, I, and I don't know, even know how I came to that. It was just, no, done. And then when I came out uh, years later, I was probably 17, 18 years old. And I had said to her, and we, we were trying to have a relationship still via telephone, whatnot. And I had said, you know, this is who I am. And this is, you know, my truth. And she still couldn't tell hers. Even when we lived, to, we all lived together. I was with them the entire time. Still couldn't. Hmm. And I think that's what made me so honest and made me realize that, oh, hell no. Like lying does nothing for you. It's, it's the ultimate form of disrespect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how I think. And to this day, I mean, I'd rather be silent than lie. And, and, and I'm the worst, like, and I'm, I'm not a good, I'm not good in silence either. <laughs> so I'm just like, I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't ask my opinion if you don't want it. Yeah. I'll be like, well, maybe not that, you know? Uh, but, <laughs> and so when I uh, finally left there, I was so 
broken yet had grown up so much. So even at that time, I was kind of an anomaly. And I moved in with my parents who had had a baby the same week. Could you imagine a broken 15, 16 year old and a newborn baby? No. Yeah. And so we're all here together. And I finished high school. I worked almost full time in high school. I was just always a worker and and just always driven. And I graduated third in my class and I didn't even take my finals. I didn't even take finals. I was like, who cares at this point? Well, do you you think, is is it possible, Derek, that um, school, because you were clearly gifted at it, it was a refuge for So it's like, oh, um, honey, 100%. Yeah. Because, and that's why, you know, it's like I had done this other interview and it's funny because I, uh, these interviews, I kind of, put, a lot of things come out that I'm like, oh, I never really thought of that, you know, but because um, I already said that I lived in this fantasy world and that was my refuge for a long time, especially during the homelessness, because it really was my refuge. Mm-hmm. And so when I got out and no one really bothered me and, you know, it wasn't like this trauma constantly on me, I just kind of did my thing and school was safe. Right. And also that's where my service started. And that's where I started putting two and two together where the service really turned into other things. And Mm -hmm. so I became a special Olympics coach. I taught middle school math as a peer tutor to kids with down syndrome and uh, kids uh, with, um, Uh, learning issues. And that kind of developed into more. So when I get out of school, I knew no one. I wanted to be in fashion so badly and, or, and like events and parties and things like that. Cause I'd always dreamed of this life that I have now. And so, because I knew no one, I was in New Hampshire, like, you know, nothing. And so I just started volunteering at everything. So if I wasn't working, I was volunteering. And, you know, it's funny because in today, and I know you do so much speaking also, and every time I do a speaking thing and the Q&As come in, it's like to, to young people, especially now, they're like, how long before I don't have to work for free anymore? And I'm like, oh, honey, oh, honey, I work for free every day. I will work for free for the rest of my life. And the biggest things that have ever happened to me is from doing that. You know, so whether it's even mentally, so spiritually, career, It's so everything. interesting that they're even considering it working as opposed to being of service. Oh, I know. I know. And, you know, I, I always tell everyone in those instances, I, literally, I said the bit, my big break in my career came from helping the homeless get close. And the New York Times put me on the front page of the style section. And that changed my career that day. Okay, the phone take, started us from ringing. There. Take, take us from there. So the New York Times has you on the cover of the style section that is probably the most coveted position in all of style to this day, right? Pre-social media, pre-social media. So even more important. Right. So, so what happens? I mean, you're not homeless at that time anymore, right? Take us through your career trajectory. Somebody lets you know, hey, Derek, you're on the cover of the deal. So basically we, I had, uh, I was back in New York living in Manhattan. I was in Manhattan and The center of the universe. Yes. I had a little team and we, uh, we didn't know if the piece was actually coming out. I had been interviewed for it, but they had just come in more observed. And I had a program called how to be Derek fabulous, which meant help teach, inspire, love, and have fun. And it was a character that I had created Uh, because I hadn't 
healed still. And I wanted to do something to heal myself and to continue to keep healing from all the childhood traumas and the different things that had happened. So I created this program with the Bottomless Closet in New York City. And uh, I just started doing workshops. And I was in the industry and I had all my friends and all the makeup artists and all the hair people and everyone. And I would just do, do these once a month workshops. I would do artist brunches where I would, you know, get money from all my friends and all the artists and gather clothes and whatnot. We'd have a big, fabulous brunch and, and do as much service as we could and get people in the doors to help and, you know, garnering volunteers is very difficult, you know, especially in this world now. And so, you know, that that's kind of how I really started doing a lot of bigger uh, philanthropic work. And and then, like I said, it just really randomly, it was part of the programs they had and the Times had seen the programs and they're like, who, who the hell is Derek Fabulous? What the hell is this? And they were like, who is this person? And so they show up and I mean, this is a million years ago now. And they were like, who are you? You know, it's like, I'm wearing all this like Japanese, you know, my hair was black and kind of, so, you know, like flock of seagulls. Like I looked very, um, the fifth element, if you remember that movie from a million yes. years ago. And yeah. And so, and, and then these women, I'm helping these women get career clothes. And the writer's like, what? This is so funny. And, but the, the thing that came through with it and what I really loved about the article was that she was showing the women fighting with me about everything. Cause I was like, oh, you should do this. And they're like, no, I don't like that. And what I loved about it was that it showed that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, if you have the power of will and fight and knowing who you are, you can always grow. You can always rebuild. You know, today might be the worst day of your life, but the tomorrow could be the best. Mm -hmm. And you just have to always remember that. So you had mentioned earlier that you were suicidal. You, as we know today, mental health is such an unbelievable issue. I mean, the stats are quite staggering. I don't even want to get into it. It's depressing. I know. Um, is your work going in? in are, are, you, are you dealing with that at all? With the suicidal people? With Funny the enough. Y y yes, a bit. Um, you know, I, I just think violence in general is becoming so, you know, uh, literally this week, uh, Thursday, a very dear friend of mine, uh, who is the Senator of Nevada, uh, I met her at a speaking engagement. She's a wonder, truly. Mm -hmm. I was riveted seeing her speak every time. It's just wow. And she's running for mayor of Las Vegas. And I just, I have a, a, one of my magazines, it's called Guru's Magazine. I just had her on the cover mm -hmm. and I had dinner with her son and I had dinner with, you know, um, and I know her team and we had just done a shoot and I just put her on the cover two, three weeks ago. Thursday night, her son, who I've had dinner with, who is polite and charming and lovely, shot his cousin and went to jail for attempted murder on Thursday night, this last week. When I tell you, I know this boy, I've spent time with this boy. He is polite and lovely and so sweet. But what has happened in this world now is that there's so much coming at us constantly. Everything is negative. And so many people are kind of going within and there is no explanation. It's just, they're ex just exploding in one way or the other. Literally this morning, I just read that there was um, in St. Louis, another high school shooting today, this morning. I, I, I three, didn't even hear that. 
I didn't even three, hear that. three children murdered, three children murdered, and and so many. And so this is just happening. And whether they're either taking it out on themselves or others, and a lot of them, as we know, you know, they'll kill everyone and then themselves. And it's just, I, I think that, you know, I mean, we know stats that children, especially, it takes two to two and a half years for true trauma to show itself. Mm -hmm. And we're we're coming into that now. And that's why it's so staggering. Post, and post then COVID. yeah post COVID. And then on top of that, the pressures of everything else. And then the fact that they're so now even more disconnected than ever because COVID really made them uh, have them on their phones. And they're so, that's the only way they really connect. And that's really traumatizing. They don't have socialization. And then they're forced out the door and everyone's running out. And it's like, ah, you know, what, you know, I mean, we were all were like that after COVID and some people have coping skills, but those years that they've lost are a developmental lot. years for them, a you lot. know, and what, and, and I'm not saying, I, I don't know everyone's life, you know, but for a lot of these children, they might not have the greatest at home life. And it's also very difficult as a teen you know, they're like, you know, they're, they're yeah. emotional and just different things and dealing with parents that have, they haven't been around as much because it's a much different world and everyone works 24 hours a day. And so they haven't been in that family unit for so long. And we don't know. And behind what happens behind closed doors, we don't know about, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of abuse that none of us will ever know or they'll ever talk about. And they internalize everything. and so it's gonna come out somehow. And unfortunately it's coming out through violence and suicide and just mm -hmm. acting out in general and a lot of online hate, mm -hmm. a lot of online hate, which I've recently have really suffered from because Anne Heche was one of my best friends. And the day that she Got in the crash. I was the first person at the hospital with her podcast business partner, and you know, and and who is also an, a sister. And these girls are my girls. You know, right. and every time anything wonderful happened, boom, they're the calls. And to lose her in such a tragic way, and then the vitriol that came, which was honestly so unexpected, and. At first, you're angry, but then I felt bad for them. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I just have to love them because they're not getting love, which is why they're angry, which is why they're full of vitriol, which is why they're attacking. Because these are people that clearly are unhappy don't have enough self-love to not attack others. And, mm -hmm. and it's really scary wh wh where we've come. And people feel very safe behind the computer screen. But at the same time, if you were busy, happy <laughs> in your life and, you know, with your children and your families and had friends or whatever, you wouldn't feel the need to sit there and attack people right. and with lives that you know nothing about and, and without facts, frankly, because right. that was, you know, I mean, people were coming at me even weeks ago saying that my friend and I killed her. And I was like, what? Like, but it's outrageous. And, but at the same time, like I said, I'm like, oh. you know, I don't get upset. I can't take it personally because I know it's not. And also, I mean, like, that's not a fact. And, you know, even to the point where, and it, but it's become, it's like that everywhere, you know, a major network, an editor call to apologize from the network, how they treated us. Wow. That's hopeful. A major, major top four. That's hopeful. That's hopeful. Well, I think, okay, so let's, Let's take this and run with this. And, and just to what you're saying, I do feel like social media 
and, you know, false book, Instagram, it's their highlights, not their real life kind of thing, right? And kids, their brains aren't developed yet. We as adults are in, like, think everybody else is living their best life and what are we doing, right? And then there's the disconnection of people, of families, and there, the lack of the ability to effectively communicate social skills. It's, it's mind blowing. And in fairness to everybody, there's so much information coming at us so fast than any other time in history. We really don't know how to process it. And then to your point, people are having visceral reactions to information that's never been vetted. So people are getting violently angry over something they heard that may or may not be true. Like all you have to do is ask the next question, which nobody does. Go ahead, what? No, but that's the point. I was like, you. Where did your facts come from? Did you see this on Instagram or Facebook? You know, and like, and it was funny because in the beginning, when everything, everyone's like, she's drunk, she's drunk, uh, my oh, friend. And I was right, like, yeah, yeah. that's what I heard, but I don't follow like, that stuff. So I don't know. No, I was like, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. The fact that you even think she's up normally to be drunk is shocking. Like she's an artist, she lived an artist life and she- she for sure had demons and she for sure was eccentric, you know, but that was part of her genius. And that what she did, a unicorn. you know, she was a unicorn. Thank you. Oh, cause she was a unicorn 100%. And that's what I loved about her. And you know, it's funny how, and I think that you could relate to this because I, I see you being part of this process on my side of this. I don't you find it so funny that people have this obsession with being normal. What is normal? I don't get, I don't get that. And you know it's like we live, you know, I live in Hollywood and they always want everyone to be very normal, you know? And it's like there are these actors, right? That's an oxymoron, Hollywood and normal, but go ahead. (laughs) I know. And it's like, they're like, oh, well, she's so normal or she's, and I was like, you are talking about a group of people that you're all obsessed with, by the way, that pretend to be other people for a living. (laughs) And the better they are at it, the more, you know, like, yeah, right. They need to be. Because if you're a genius at that, honey, you are not, no. This Let is, me, you may, are so out of body. May, may I comment on what you're saying? So two, yeah. two things. I think you're, you're using the word normal. And I think people confuse normal with people desperately wanting to be accepted. Desperate. See, you didn't need that. You didn't need normal. You wanted to be accepted as a unicorn. So all that divide from normal and acceptance when you're not being true to yourself, all that noise, all that that trauma, all that disconnect, you bypassed. Homeless or not, you you didn't have to take that road, which you you can never, it's a gap that you can't connect anyway. So I think there's that piece that's going on. And then the question will become, well, accepted by whom and for what? Who do we need to be accepted by? Ourselves, right? And then- Self-love is all that matters, right? Right. And then you project that and that comes back to you. But, and that's where your service comes in. But when, when you talk about actors and actresses, it was so funny. I can't remember who I was talking to recently. But I was saying how the better, and you know, you know this better than me. So tell me, the the more successful you are as an actor or actress taking on a role, it seems to me perhaps the less grounded you are. Because if you can really identify and play that role, it's maybe because you're not so solid yourself. I don't know. Is that fair or not fair? I think that, you know, I will say the more genius the actor has been that I've, that I've known, the more 
kind of disconnected they can be because mm-hmm. of the fact that they have to turn themselves into something else. Right. And the it's more genius you are at that, the more you're able to disconnect. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I think that people, that confuses people, I think. And they don't really understand how to, they don't really seem to understand the concept of that, where, I mean, when you think about it, when you think it through and you're like, wow, they're un like, they're unrecognized, but that's why people win Oscars for these unbelievable transformations they do is because they have that ability to disconnect at a level where you would never know it's them. And that, I think that on a relatability level scares them, you know? And for the actor, it also makes them very um, unsure when they have to go now and be themselves. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it also explains, and you tell me that why when 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 couples meet on a set and they fall in love and then they get married or whatever, it doesn't last. To me, it was like because you fell in love with not who you really the person really was. You fell in love with the character. I'm asking. Yes, but I will tell you that a lot of times that when you meet on set, it's like meeting in the office. You know, you're Mm -hmm. you're you go to work and depending on what you're doing, I mean, not everybody's like, a you know, at that level or or doing a project at that level. Mm -hmm. And so you go to work and who do you see? And also for for some of them, not all. For some of them, it's very difficult to meet people because they're very isolated. And that's that's a very isolating career because the minute you have real notoriety, people are constantly coming over to you. People are constantly wanting something. They want to know you. They want to take pictures with you. And that's, you know, that's the society we live in. I have have a lot of actresses that, that are friends and different things. And it's like, oh, picture, 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 you know, and it just depends on where you are. So you have to be very conscious of where you're going. You know, the other night I'm out at dinner with like Corey Feldman, who I never met Mm -hmm. and, and then Tara Reed and Taryn Manning. And those two are very good girlfriends of mine. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they've been through the ups and downs and the ringers of it all. And, and Hollywood's a very, very, very tough, tough place and you feel like you're getting headway and then boom the tide turns on you Mm -hmm. and it's very difficult with when you're constantly gigging and you're the product right and a lot of people have a hard time figuring out how to separate the product from themselves yeah and so how do you do that How do you do that, Derek? Because you're very, very well known in circles. You're in Hollywood. I can't imagine that you go out to dinner and you don't, can I get your autograph? Can I get your picture? Or more to the point, somebody wants something from you. How do you know what's a real friendship? What's a real relationship? How do you, how do you negotiate all that? That's very funny because I've gone through that a lot. Um, Especially now, you know, a, a lot of things I have my key core group and then uh, there's everyone else, you know. So that core group long-term before you were who you are? Oh, I've had the same friends for 20 something years and I have newer friends too. And I, um, I have just kind of gotten to a place where I'm very open to it all because so much of what I have I have built a place where I can offer it. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people want to be in the magazines or a lot of people want this, that, and the other. And so if they put in that much effort and they need it that bad, it's mine to give away. And so I'm okay with it. And I know I'm very aware, you know, and I have people in my life. And let me just interrupt for a second for the listeners. 
just so you know, for the record, Derek owns Wharton, Wharton, Warburton Media, uh, owner of Mr. Warburton Magazine, Guru Magazine, editor in chief of Bridget Th uh, British Thoughts, um, the owner, this, a ton of media out there. So just yeah. in case listeners didn't know, but I'm sure they also. Hmm. Yeah, and then I had the makeup line, which is Derek's fabulous. It, it's about to launch. The brand new collection is called Boundless, not bound by age, society, gender, or anything. It's I need just it. about I need feeling. It. I need it's it. about <laughs> feeling beautiful, and uh, we're about to launch that in the next two weeks. And then uh, I developed uh, a very casual clothing line, caps and hoodies, and just really cozy stuff based on the makeup. That launches later in, in November, too. Oh, that is and then, brilliant. Okay, so let, let me ask you a question, then going back to what you just said. Yeah. If somebody goes through the effort to connect with you, to get to know you, you're in a position, it's yours to give away, you said, right? You're in a position to meet their need. I've heard this throughout this entire conversation this word keeps creeping into my mind about you. And so I'm going to ask you now, how did you develop such an empathic leadership persona? So, so much empathy. Uh, I, I am, even when you are homeless, I am struck by it. You are always, it appears to be, you are often given the other person who might be so nice the benefit of the doubt? Because it's who I am. I don't, and I've been hurt by it 50 times, trust me. I'm not hurt by it anymore, I don't care. I've let it go because, you know, it, it's happened recently and it was a pain for me. I was like, I don't wanna do it. But at the same time, I felt that, you know, everything they're trying to be, you already are. So at least if you help and guide them by leading by example, with luck, they will, they will get it. And so just give it to them because it's mine to give and I'm already all of these things. So what it's, it, what, what is it? that is stopping me from being kind. It costs you, you know? nothing. It costs you nothing. So it's you the know? Gandhi, be, be the change you want to see in the world, in a way. I, I mean, I don't, I would rather feed the homeless every night than go to a bar. I would rather do, you know, these things that it's just, I feel like I spend a lot of my time wanting to feed my soul. And at every level though, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like you have to be selfish or you have to be mean or you have to grip everything to be a success. I think a success and wealth is a 360 degree sphere. And I have the power to give it all away. You know, and so I've been definitely in my life, I've been up and down financially, very much so, even when I had, I, you know, and so. And now I'm at a very key place and I learned a lot this year and I had gone through a major emotional breakthrough um, very early this year, what, but what, unbeknownst ask, to myself. You, so, so basically you're saying you come from a place of abundance, right? And also the circle, it's calm. What goes around comes around. What, what, what have you learned this year? What did you learn this year? That I learned a lot of different things, but I, I'm kind of a, I've been, even though I'm an artist, I also have a very analytical side. Mm -hmm. And I also 
place myself in an ecosphere and I'm constantly, it's almost like an Uno, th- uh, not Uno. Um, what is that? What is that? Uh, Rubik's cube, Rubik, right? Yeah. Because the world is like that. And I'm constantly trying combinations Try, like, Hmm, what if I did this with this and this and this and this and this, and I, I build organically where it's like, you know, and layers. And mm-hmm. I always talk about that. And this year I had, uh, I'd gone home and I hadn't been home in a really long time. And where is home? And where is home? New Hampshire. That's what you consider home. Okay. Yeah. So my dad, my stepmom, my entire family, they're all there. And I went home and I got on the plane and I felt sick. And I was like, what's wrong with you? You'll be whatever. And I had never been a crier in my life because I always felt that I had to be strong. And what I learned is that through going through this emotional situation and I cried constantly all the beginning of this, I was like, what is happening to me? And then from that, I learned that being emotional, being open, sharing and crying everything to get it out of you is real strength. Mm -hmm. That's the real strength because I was always afraid to do that because I thought everyone would think I was just weak and whatnot. And I was like, hold on. No, the real strength is showing who you really are. And even though like I put on this face and whatever, but now I've just come to this other space where the outside and the inside have come together really strongly. And that's why even more so, I've been so opened that I can learn lessons. I'm learning lessons constantly. I'm figuring out things easier. I'm just in such a space that it's been really miraculous. And it's funny, when I was going through that, I've always had weight issues. That's the one thing that has been like the gripper of everything left that has been really a struggle for me was the weight. And I took off 30 pounds during this entire process. And so now I'm thinner than I've ever been. Not that I, weight is everybody's thing. You know what I mean? And I think everyone is beautiful, however they are. For me, it was a crutch Mm -hmm. and it was, and it was a real issue. And so when all of that came off all at the same time, And then uh, I won an award uh, in Miami and I had never admitted being suicidal before. And so I go to, to win this award. I get on stage. There's 300 people there. It's being filmed and it's this major thing to be televised. And I admitted for the first time that I was suicidal as a teen and I had never told anybody, not my, my parent, no one. And it was such a, <sighs> and Pathotic. Pathotic. it was like, oh my gosh. And you know, and what has come from that alone, that alone changed my life, you know, cause a week later, somebody was in the audience filming it, that speech showed it to my partners uh, in the cosmetic company and they made me the offer to give me my own line a week later. I had never met them ever from that speech alone. And I was like, well, look at you now. Look at you now. It's so so interesting because I've been guests on podcasts and I've gotten clients from never haven't spoke to somebody they're like they heard I heard you it's like you're not rehearsing right you're just being real so if I may so what you just so that's so interesting because very early on in our conversation you mentioned suicidal now maybe I just picked up on it because I'm weird but I'm like oh there's something there like there, there's something but um so so we know when we repress emotions they become amplified it's just a matter of how they come out, right? 
So what you did was you got to a point where you allowed your, the, the suicide was was way to express your vulnerability. When you are comfortable expressing our vulnerability, that's when we can have real intimacy in our lives. Right now, we sure as hell can get hurt by that. Right. That's how you get hurt in intimate relationships. I expose myself to how could you do this? You knew this is what would off. Right. So that's where the whole trust issue comes in. But it but it sounds like when you went on the stage at for whatever was the crying, as you described on the plane, you're at a point in your life. And I'm wondering why, where the crying was just the shedding of all the defenses, the shedding of the not being in touch with yourself. So what, 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 what was that catalyst for you? Do you know? I think it was, you know, I hadn't been home. I had also, and, and I'm not being funny, I got a puppy. Oh, and no, well, they are very therapeutic. I'm not, there's nothing funny about that. And I just love him. And he's the, cu- the cutest thing. And I, and we were definitely having growing pains because, and I just finally, like after all these years, cause I had one, I had had, well, we had a farm basically of animals that I, I, I think I'd put caring for animals in this box of what had happened in the past when I was living with my mother and her partner and part of the abuse factor because I had to take care of the 10, 10 dogs, 20 cats, goats, chickens, all these things as part of this layer of you know, not being able to speak in the house, putting my head on the table when everyone's done eating. If I spoke, I was just annihilated for speaking and and not being able to leave my room, except to mow the lawn for two hours every day and to feed the animals. Right. 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 And I think that that was such a part of the that package that it took me so long to even open up enough to get a dog and then it was a little tough the the goats were the goats were higher on in the hierarchy in the family than you right without question i was just a possession at that point you know and it was more of a we hate your father and we own you but that's literally that's basically Do, do you do you happen to look like more like your dad than your mom do you know how would you answer that uh, I think at the, at the time, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, growing up, yes, I would say that I did look like my dad more. Yeah, so, for sure. So just to add more fuel to the fire there, go ahead. Yeah, so they, no, they, of course. not only that, but they, and even if you didn't look like him, they thought you looked like him, right? Yeah. That confirmation bias. Yeah. Yeah. And so. You know, I think that I had put all of that in that box. And then the minute I just kind of broke down and and said yes, and it was so organic how he came to my life. And I um and then I took him home with me. And it was funny how I think when I when I had gotten home, I think I felt very like disconnected and all of those feelings had come back from that time when I was 15, 16, when I moved back in and I felt like that child again. And it took me a minute and that's when the crying happened, all this stuff happened. And it took me a minute to say, you are not that anymore. Look who you are. Look what you've done. And you should be proud of your growth. And I had it connected them, you know? Mm -hmm. And then all of that kind of came as a catalyst when I gave that speech. Everything came out. And since then, it's been unbelievable, honestly. And then, you know, and then when... 
the tragic accident just happened. I had never spoken so honestly and openly about friendships and love. And for the listeners, just to clarify, you're speaking about the uh, loss of Anne Hecht. Yeah. Anne Hish, yes. Um, sorry, and, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, and like, I had started posting a little bit before that, but then, and I had started doing interviews that were very, a lo- just a lot more real than I ever would. Cause it was always, you know, I'd always done glossy things like, oh, this is fabulous. You know what I mean? And that's what they had always kind of booked me for. But then there was a turn. And I mean, even how I got to you today was through one of your bookers had seen me on a show and I've gotten a lot from doing that show. And he was a great interviewer and I just opened up and I was like, wow. And people in my life that are good friends were calling me like, oh my God, I didn't know any of this about you. And we've been friends for 20 years. And I just, that's that was all when, like, I really, truly had just really started this opening. And, and then when, like I said, with, with her tragic accident, I felt protective of her because it was so salacious in the beginning not based on any fact and and then of course in the end it was all mostly untrue everything that they had said from the very beginning am i allowed to am i does it matter should i ask what did happen do we know what the cause of death was no one knows oh okay there's i mean the cause of death is that her car ran into the house and then the house caught on fire and she burned to death for 45 minutes. I, I did not hear that. Oh my and I did, and what I think, and, but the reason why I really defended her in the very beginning, because no one was speaking and no one was out there defending her. And I was like, this is my great love. And this is my adopted, you know, she used to say, cause we look so much alike, like, like you and I do. And <laughs> <laughs> anyone, yeah. anyone listening, we were talking, she was like, Oh, we look so much alike before this. And, um, and so, you know, she, and I was like, we were cosmic twins, you know, and I wanted people to know because I know my tribe, I know they believe me. I know that they know I would never lie. And I w- just told my truth about her and what I knew. And, and I was like, please pray because these headlines are, are not based on any fact. And frankly, it's so salacious that, and the attacks are so heinous. And this is a woman who you all don't, can't seem to understand burned in a car for 45 minutes and there isn't a kind word for her in this in the middle of this and then when they they saw because we weren't putting out any statements that were we 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 just weren't sure what was really you know what because it was like it was really touch and go I mean they really wouldn't even give us we were we were begging for information in the hospital it was Heather and I in the hospital who I told you about earlier, she's her podcast partner, but they were business partners and best friends too. And it was her and I at the hospital. That's it. And we're begging for information and we really couldn't get any. And we sat there for six, eight hours begging. And, and then all this stuff is coming and we're like, yeah, we can't get info. How do you think you, you have no, you have nothing. And so, but that's how, and I know that how the media works. And also I know that everything's clickbait and that's what they're all looking for. And there was not one investigative journalist. I I know this for a fact. And, you know, like I got interviewed for things and like the, the, one of the first questions for a major, major newspaper top 
two in America. So how many times have you done cocaine with her? First question out of their mouth. And I'm like, number one, I've never done a, an illegal drug in my life. I've never smoked a cigarette, nothing. And I'm telling you, I've never, ever seen her do drugs, ever. And he's like, well, other friends. And I said, well, I'm not other friends. I've never witnessed it. She never talked to me about it because I don't, that's not my lifestyle. Right. You know, you don't and play, I you don't play that way. Like that. Yeah. I mean, gr- gr- honey, we were champagne happy for sure. And we love Sapina Grigio, but that was it, you know. And when yeah. we were all together, it was a celebration of friendship and love and just being ourselves and right. Right. having a great time. And that was my relationship. And so, but that's really when I really went like, I really opened up and it was, it was a lot. It's been very painful. I mean, it's almost three months now, you know, it's over two and a half months and it, it, it was tough and having to defend someone in a situation that was so dire and then to die in the middle of all of that without, again, without a kind word. And then all of a sudden, when they see the, when they see the tide turn, oh, well, and that I learned a lot from that. A lot. I I think I, I'm so, at first, I didn't know a lot of that. I don't, I don't follow the celebrity gossip. I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's gossip, right? And, uh, but I'm, I'm so sorry that, gosh, that she went through that, that you went through that, that her family's going through that. Yet, as we know, you know, there's a yin and a yang in life, right? So it it sounds like there's a lot about her tragedy that has liberated you. And, and perhaps she's living on in that newfound liberation. You know, we're really doing everything we can to honor her. And uh, because she changed culture for the LGBTQ plus community when she was the first celebrity to come out of the closet per se, you know, and when she walked that red carpet with Ellen all those years ago mm-hmm. and that, suffered. I can't believe that was that, that I know. I can't believe it was that long ago. It was 98 wow. and wow. she was escorted out of her own movie premiere uh, by security. So the, she was not allowed to go to her own party for her own movie. And the next day she was fired from her $10 million contract from Fox. And she didn't care. She knew what was right. And I honor that, that if you could imagine the coming out stories that I've gotten, that Heather has gotten that we, yeah. Unbelievable people writing to us and like the, uh, her and Ellen had done Oprah like weeks later mm-hmm. and the coming out stories from that and just telling us like I saw her on Oprah. I watched with my mouth open. I walked in the kitchen and came out. I mean, unbelievable how. You know, it's, how- it's this is so interesting because I have a, a coaching client now I'm working with. And he is, he came to me for so many reasons, very successful. It was clear to me after our first coaching call that he was gay. It was just, but he, you know, he's living in the suburbs with the, the picket yeah. fence. So finally, he, he finally just said, I'm queer and I love it. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's funny because people, but because as you can, like me being me, now people keep approaching me coming out and right. a friend just recently came out to me and I was like, I knew something was wrong because it was just every time I saw him, it was just like very intoxicated, clearly unhappy, medicated. And, you know, and that's, that's, a that's a, 
you're hiding. You know what I mean? You can feel that there's something there. And and recently he came out and I was so proud of him because the only way is to live your truth. And you have to love yourself enough because it's all we have. You know, it's like we can have our families and all of that, but that at the end of the day, it's just us, just us. So and you've got to. Res- I, I could talk with you forever, but I want to respect your time. Um, but but you know, if you will only get back the love that you have to, as much as you love yourself or lack thereof, that is how other people will treat you. And it's really that simple. And if you don't love yourself, nobody else will. Amen. And if you use yourself, so will other people. You, you set your own standard. So, it's funny I, because, and just one last, one last thing that. Oh, I, I, I we can keep going. <laughs> I don't know. I do have to go. Um, one, you know, something that I knew that I built on because sometimes, and I think this is great advice for people that have a hard time with any of this kind of concept. If you can take one thing, like one concept of love or self-love or anything and build on it, you have a foundation and the foundation can be anything. You know what I mean? You can be anything if you have the right foundation. And right. so much of us build this life with no foundation. It's like building and a I, house and picking out the curtains and the foundation isn't built. And I am a foundation builder. And oh, I've learned that more cool. later, but I am like, uh, uh, no, if we don't have this, this can fall. And I, that's not going to happen. And so- Foundation builder. I love it. One thing that I very young was able to build on as a foundation. My parents, whom I love, pain in the ass sometimes, but I do love them, were so adamant about my biological mother and I being in a relationship after I left. They, they never knew the truth, by the way, until much later. Uh, they, it was all lies that was part of the whole facade because she was a lie and then everything, she, they didn't even know we were homeless. Seriously, nothing. They knew nothing. And so as time goes on, I'm leaking a little bit, telling them a little bit more, you know, whatever, but it, nothing really came out until years later. And they were so adamant that I would have a relationship with her, especially my father. And finally, one day, and I was in my 20s, my early 20s, and I said, hear me now. It is an honor to be in my life. Don't betray that honor or you'll be out too. And I have had a good relationship with them ever since. That, I, I just got the chills. Because if I can cut my biological mother, I can cut you too. And you better honor this. Because this, you will not have the joy of me. I love it. And don't forget it. I love and it. I was very young when that happened. And I've built so much of my growth and honoring myself off of the uh, off of that quote and i tell people all the time i love that i love that one more question i have so many more let me just ask uh, one more question what's the one song you can't live without song Mm -hmm. okay i do have something really funny I don't know if it's the one song I can't live without. It's something from my youth that, or someone from my youth that 
that meant a lot to me. So during that time living with uh, my biological mother and her partner, I loved Debbie Gibson <laughs> way, 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 way back. Okay. So Electric Youth was like my favorite and out of the blue and all these songs, right? And I was a singer when I was young, school stuff, but I had auditioned to be in this chorus and I beat 10,000 students to get into this. And they took 10 people wow. and I got in. And I walked away because I walked away finally, you know, but last week, Debbie Gibson followed me on Instagram. And I was like, and so, and I told my friends and they were like, oh God. And I was like, you don't understand how that kept me alive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like these little yeah. joys. And I think like now being who I am now and what I've achieved in life that so many of those people from my past are coming back because I've gotten to a place in life where they've become peers. And it's just very funny that I uh, have gotten there. And then it's just ra really random stuff that just were people that felt, you know, th there's people in our lives that are not necessarily in our lives that feel just untouchable. untouchable. And yeah. now, you know, it's like, oh, she's friends with blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, I just did the same show she did or something like that. And that's a real, that makes me very proud. Very proud. Well, it's not a coincidence the way you described that plane ride with the dog and the crying. It, it's, I think the best is yet to come for you. If, if I, I think so you. too. I All think right. so too. Well, thank you. Thank you. This, this was great. This was so, so grateful. So great. I'm so so great. grateful. And thank you. I mean, you're so renowned and to have the honor to sit here and talk to you is just such a pleasure. And thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.